Welcome to worship for Sunday, February 7th, 2021. And I just want to be able to encourage you, this is going to be a great video worship experience with meditation time, prayer time, some scripture reading, and some great teaching today on what it means to be able to understand the gospel and then share it. So enjoy the rest of this worship experience. You want to email me afterwards, r-d-u-g-a-l-l at apu.edu and tell me what you thought. That'd be awesome. Have a great rest of your weekend in worshiping and serving the Lord. If you know any Christians, or if you happen to be one, you've probably heard the word gospel as a kind of summary of Christian belief, connected to phrases like, God loves you, or Jesus died for your sins. But over time, religious words like gospel can lose their power and meaning by becoming too familiar. So let's take a moment to rediscover what this important word, gospel, meant to the people who wrote the Bible. Gospel translates the Old Testament Hebrew verb, biser, and the noun, besorah. The Greek New Testament equivalent is euangelion, which is a compound word. Eu means good, and angelion means announcement. All of these words mean good news, but what kind of news? Well, in Hebrew, biser is what we might call national news, or a royal announcement. Like when King David hears a messenger biser that his army was victorious in battle. That means he still rules on his throne over the people of Israel. And after David dies, his throne is passed on to Solomon, his son. And when he was inaugurated as king in Jerusalem, a herald spreads the Besorah, that a new ruler is in charge. But after Solomon's death came a bunch of bad news kings, whose corruption led their nation into self-destruction. This is why the prophet Isaiah announced the good news that one day the God of Israel would come as the cosmic king to confront all corrupt and violent kingdoms and restore his rule over all nations. And so, when Jesus of Nazareth hit the public stage, he continued Isaiah's gospel when he went around announcing the euangelion of God's kingdom. Jesus claimed that God was restoring his reign over his people Israel and over all nations, and he was the one bringing it all about. Now, the euangelion about a new king in charge means a new way of life. Jesus said that living in God's kingdom meant following him by putting down the sword and seeking peace through radical forgiveness and generosity, even toward your enemies. His good news required people to make a decision. This is why Jesus took his euangelion to Jerusalem to confront the corrupt and violent kingdoms of his day. But he challenged them in a surprising way with the power of God's generous love. As Jesus was being executed by his enemies, he received his crown and was mocked as a fake king. But he displayed true royal authority by forgiving his tormentors. Jesus was the one in charge that day, giving his life for the sins of others. And then, a few days later, everything changed. Jesus rose from the dead as the true king, whose love is stronger than death. He appeared to hundreds of his followers and told them to spread the euangelion, that all authority in heaven and on earth now belongs to him. And they did share this good news all over the ancient world. They did it by writing the four accounts of Jesus' life that are the gospel. That is, they tell the story of how Jesus brought God's kingdom, how he lived for others and died for their sins, and then was raised from the dead. Jesus' followers also shared the good news by simply talking about it. This is why Peter and Paul, or Priscilla and Aquila, traveled all around sharing the royal announcement. While it might look like the rulers of our world are in charge and can do whatever they want, the good news is that the crucified and risen Jesus is the true Lord of the world, the real king of all creation. And in Jesus' kingdom, things are different. It's where the real leaders are the servants, because the last are first and the first go to the back of the line. It's where the hungry are fed and the homeless are welcome, because love is the most powerful reality of God's kingdom. And this good news is not easy to believe. It actually sounds kind of crazy when you first hear it, but something happens when people tell the story of Jesus and start living like he really is the king of the world. That's when this gospel becomes the best news that you've ever heard. Weak and wounded sinner Lost and left to die 
Oh, raise your head for love is passing by. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus and live. Now your burdens lifted and carried far away. And precious blood has washed away the stain. So sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus, sing to Jesus, and live. And like a newborn baby. Sometimes we fall, so fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus, fall on Jesus, and live. Sometimes the way is lonely and steep and filled with pain. So if your sky is dark and pours the rain, then cry to Jesus, cry to Jesus, cry to Jesus. Music fills the night, and when you can't contain your joy inside, then dance for Jesus, dance for Jesus, dance for Jesus.
place that honors people that are exceptional at what they do. It exists to remind future generations of the greatness of these people from the past. Did you know that God has a hall of fame to remember the extraordinary people of faith who were written about in the Old Testament? And we can find that hall of fame in the New Testament of the Bible. Hebrews 11 tells us that faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. This faith is what gave people in the old days great fame. This faith is what puts them in God's Hall of Fame. By faith, Abel gave his best to God. By faith, Enoch walked with God and was a friend of God. By faith, Noah listened to God, obeyed God, trusted God, and did what's right. It was by faith that Abraham followed God and that even Sarah, Abraham's wife, believed that God would keep his promise. It was by faith that Isaac promised blessings for the future to his sons, Jacob and Esau. And by faith, Jacob blessed his sons and worshiped God. By faith, Joseph believed that God would guide him and see him through every troubled time. By faith, Moses looked forward to the great reward that God had in store for him and led the people of Israel out of captivity. It was by faith that Rahab was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God. And it was by faith that Joshua led the people of Israel. All of these people became famous for their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God has planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So since God has given us His Hall of Fame of people who have gone before us and had great faith despite hard times, let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who makes our faith perfect, 
so that one day God may say, well done, good and faithful servant, and we may be initiated into his great Hall of Fame. Well, it's great to have you join our pre-recorded worship today. Today's message is going to be different. Why? Well, because it's not about me. And for those of you who know me and follow our ministry here in Long Valley, Idaho, that's probably great news. But I'm doing this very intentionally. It isn't very often that I run across either some sermon or a video or a book or any presentation for that matter that summarizes the core of the gospel. You know, the word gospel, the Greek word euanglion, actually is best translated good news. And people have wondered, what is the good news of Jesus in a nutshell? In other words, how could you summarize the love of God expressed to us through Jesus? How can you best express the plan of God that is epitomized in the life and ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus? In other words, if Jesus is a snapshot or the revelation of the character and nature of God, then what's that all about? How do you make that clear? Well, I believe the next two videos that you're going to see take on those questions extremely well. That's why I want you to see them and I want you to pray over them. You see, the issue of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is often distorted. The good news is turned into bad news because the love of God or the grace of God is blended with a very human tendency. And that would be to make something that is a gift into something that demands and throws us into a performance mentality. You see, trying to earn something is deeply embedded into the soul of humanity. That's why the grace of God is so radical and life-changing. If we had to perform for God, you see, prove something to God about our worthiness or try to demonstrate to God why we deserve his love, we would be in a sad state indeed. But God's love is founded on what it means to understand grace. I'm going to put a slide up upon the screen for you to look at for a few moments. I want you to see how every look at the grace of God from a divergent perspective can actually transform the nature of God from the God of love, which is what Jesus was all about, to a God of judgment. You see, this slide kind of gives us a wide scope view, a fuller view of how different theologies or different views of what it means to look at the good news of Jesus can bring us to different conclusions. Obviously, as you look at this particular chart, you can see the direction that I lean very, very passionately, that God is a loving Father. So anyway, enjoy these videos. Watch them a couple of times if necessary. Share them of with friends if you want to. And if you have any questions, email me, okay? R-D-U-G-A-L-L at A-P-U dot E-D-U. And if you want a video of just this message minus all the worship elements, I'd be happy to email you a link. Whatever the case, know that Jesus loves you. And that's not a cliche. It's a life-changing, transformational reality. You are in Jesus as you live in his love. Wow. Just simply wow. So on with these videos. The first from a pastor teacher from Canada, Brexy Cavey, and the second from a pastor in Missouri. And both of these guys are part of a movement that I've been following called the Jesus Collective. It's a movement that spans North America. And so I pray that God will bless you today as you watch this video and that you would be able to grow in God's grace and love in abundance. God bless you. In the beginning, God, the power to create the universe, made everything. Made the universe, made this planet, and he made you and me. He made us to be like him in his image, and in his likeness. And we live together in intimacy. Uh, but we haven't been given the power of free choice, which is necessary for true love to exist. God had chosen us by calling us into existence. The question is, would we choose God back? 
uh, we chose to go our own way and we separated ourselves from God. And so God didn't give up on us. He continued to pursue us. He sent prophets, messengers to come and tell us of his love. But we didn't listen to the prophets by prophets. Instead, we continued to go our own way. So finally, God said, the time is right. I'm, I'm coming for you. I'm not gonna let you continue to self-destruct like this, humankind. In fact, I'm gonna come down in a form that is just like you. I'm gonna become one of you. And in so doing, I'm gonna show you who I truly am. I'm gonna show you my heart. And so God gives us his heart in the form of Jesus. Now, Jesus, who shows us what God is like, for he is the full image of God in human form. He not only shows us what God is like, he shows us how to live. And when we follow Jesus, we can begin the journey of returning to our true selves. Again, Jesus does two things. He shows us what God is like, and he shows us how we can live, who we can become like. That's beautiful. Jesus, remember, lived in union with the Father. He died and then he rose again. And now, technically, he is in heaven at the right hand of the Father. All of this is something Paul is wanting to communicate in these verses. But it can leave us saying, that's a lot of work for me to try and be like Jesus, who is like God. Can I do it on my own? I mean, Jesus kind of sets the standard high. Perfection, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, says Jesus. But the good news is we don't have to do it on our own, do we? Jesus calls his followers to himself, teaches them how to live, and then says, I want to empower you. My own presence in spiritual form, the Holy Spirit who brings the mind of Christ and the character of Christ to you. I want to give you the spirit. So Jesus, before returning to the father, gives us the Holy Spirit. That's a bird. Yeah, looks like a bird. Good. It's a dove. It's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit doesn't only just surround us and encourage us. The Holy Spirit comes to live within us. You have the spirit of Christ inside you. You do. If you have trusted Christ, the apostle Peter, for instance, in Acts chapter two, in this Pentecostal sermon, when the spirit fell in power, he preached to people and said, uh, when you repent and believe this same gift will be given to you as well. The gift of the Holy Spirit. You have the spirit of Christ inside you. But here in Colossians, the apostle Paul goes one step further. Where are we? Where do we exist? We exist here in this world physically, but spiritually we are living in Christ. We have the spirit in us and the apostle Paul says, we are in Christ. And that phrase in Christ is brought up repeatedly throughout the New Testament. Your location in this world is in Jesus. Uh, One more thing though, what does Paul say? He says, your life Boy, these are on here pretty solid. Hold on, God's strong. Okay, good. Your life, says the Apostle Paul, is now what? Hidden with Christ in God. How beautiful. This speaks of our security, of our safety, of our intimacy with the Trinity, with the triune God. We are caught up in the love life of God right here, right now. We we live this way spatially, spiritually in principle. And one day the fullness of this will become true and truly manifest. Hello, I'm Brian Zahn, pastor of Word of Life Church in St. Joseph, Missouri. And I want to share with you something that I have found called the gospel in chairs. I didn't uh, design this. I didn't come up with this. It was originally developed by Anthony Carbo. And he is the priest at the Orthodox Church in Colorado Springs. And then I heard about it through Steve Robinson, who hosts Our Life in Christ podcast. But what the gospel in chairs is, is a presentation of the gospel in two different versions. 
There is the modern, western, judicial version of the gospel that most of us, especially in North America, are very familiar with. But then there is the more ancient, more biblical, the patristic, or it comes from the church fathers, understanding of salvation. We might call that the restorative view. So really what I'm going to do is contrast first the legal understanding of salvation with the restorative understanding of salvation. It's called the gospel in chairs. First, the legal understanding of salvation or the modern understanding, or I might even say misunderstanding. And it goes like this. In the beginning, God created man in his image and to reflect his glory and to have fellowship. But man in the garden sinned. And as man sins, he becomes sinful, and God, because he is so holy and righteous, cannot look upon sin, and so God turns away from man. But God, in his love for humanity, sends his Son to occupy our place. And Jesus Christ lives in our stead, and he lives as we were intended to live. He lives in full relationship with the Father, never turning away, always doing His will. But at the end of His life, Jesus is put to death. And in that moment, the Father does the unthinkable. He takes our sin and places it upon Jesus so that Jesus becomes sinful. And God cannot look upon sin because of His holiness and righteousness and turns away from His Son and Jesus Christ receives and experiences the full wrath of God. Now for we sinners, if we believe that God has done this and that Jesus has borne our sin and the wrath of God on our behalf, then we are protected from the wrath of God. We receive the righteousness of Christ as our clothing so that, as Martin Luther says, we are snow-covered dung. As many preachers have described it, Christ becomes our asbestos suit to protect us from the white, hot wrath of God against sinners. Now, that's if we believe this. If we don't believe that Jesus has done that, then we remain in our sin, and God's wrath remains upon us. We remain forever alienated from God, and eventually the sinner is condemned to hell. That's the legal understanding of the gospel, a modern version of it. The more ancient, the patristic, the understanding of salvation that would be common to the early church fathers, I'll call it the restorative understanding of salvation. I believe it's much more biblical. And it goes like this. In the beginning, God created man in his image to reflect his glory and to have fellowship. But in the garden, man sinned and turned away from God. As a result, man became subject to futility and death. So that the great problem that the gospel addresses is not primarily the problem of legal guilt or personal guilt, although that's included, but the problem of humanity being subject to death. That is the great problem the gospel addresses. Now, because God loves humanity and doesn't want His creation to be subject to futility and death, God takes on humanity. He becomes a human that He might heal humanity. He takes on our nature that He might heal our nature. And so, here is a woman who, because of being subject to futility and death, has lived a life where she's gone from man to man, marriage to marriage. She's been married five times. Now she's living with a man, still never finding the love that she longs for. And what happens? God comes and sits down by her at a well. And he says, I am the water of life, and I will love you. Here is a man who, for the sake of greed and ambition, has become a tax collector. That is, he's in collusion with the occupying Romans. And he participates in a system 
of oppressive taxation against his own people. As a result, he is ostracized and alienated daily. He has wealth and power, very few friends. No one wants to eat with him. No one wants to be his friend. But what happens? God comes and sees this tax collector up in the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'll eat with you. I want to go to your house. And he says, salvation has come to this man's house. Here is a woman who has been caught in adultery. The religious establishment has condemned her and they want to stone her. But when she is brought into the presence of God and thrown down at His feet, God kneels down beside her and says, Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And then He speaks to the woman and says, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. Here is a man who has been so captured by the powers of darkness that he's inhabited by a legion of demons. He seems no longer hardly to be human. He's driven forth from his village. He lives in the cemetery. He no longer wears clothes. He cuts his body. He's become a madman. Everybody's afraid to go anywhere near that graveyard. But here comes God. And He sails across the Sea of Galilee. And He says, I will come to you and I will set you free. And he casts out the demons and the darkness so that the man is now clothed and in his right mind sitting with God. Here is a man who simply because of the random nature of, the humani of humanity subject to death has contracted some terrible disease that has caused him to be a paralytic. And when he is brought into the presence of God, what does God say? He says, son, your sins are forgiven you. And rise, take up your bed, and walk. And when humanity, driven by fear and pride, maintaining its system of an axis of power enforced by violence, take God and betray Him, spit upon Him, mock Him, scourge Him, condemn Him, and crucify Him. What does God say? I forgive you. And when humanity experiences the final dissolution and falls away into death to be forever separated from God, God says, love is greater than the grave and though you make your bed in Sheol, I am there. And God in Christ joins humanity in death. In His wild pursuit of humanity, God is willing to go all the way down into death. But God also says, I am the resurrection and the life. And He conquers death. I am He that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of death and Hades. And he says, all who are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of Man and they shall come out of their tombs. So now there is no place where God is not. He fills all things with His love. For God is love. And there flows from the heart of God's love a river of fire. To those that respond to God's love with love, they return love for love. That love of God, like a river of fire, provides light and warmth. But to those who respond towards hatred, re respond with hatred towards God's love, they experience that river of fire as wrath. The Apostle Paul said it like this, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If your enemy is thirsty, give him drink. That is, continue to love him and treat him in love. But the, the Apostle Paul also says it will be like burning coals upon his head if he continues to hate and be your enemy. But all he has to do is turn around and say, instead of hating, I will love. And then when you give your former enemy who is now a friend food and drink, it's no longer torment to him, but it is the joy of a shared meal. This is the restorative, more biblical, more ancient, patristic understanding of the nature of salvation. The crucial difference is this. First of all, 
In this version of the gospel, you never pit God against Christ. Keep this in mind. Two foundational truths of Christian theology. Number one, God is immutable. He doesn't change. Number two, God is perfectly revealed in Christ. Christ did not come to change the Father or to placate the Father or to satisfy the Father. Christ came to reveal the Father. God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There's never been a time when God was like Jesus, but we haven't always known what God is like, but now we do. The Apostle Paul said it like this. God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. He didn't say that God was in Christ reconciling Himself to the world. It is, it's not the Father that needed to be reconciled to the world. It's the world that needed to be reconciled to the Father. And that's why Jesus, perfectly revealing the heart of the Father, confronts the sin of humanity with simply this, I forgive you. The other difference is, you see that in the restorative, patristic, more ancient, more biblical understanding of salvation, God is never turning away from humanity. See, God is perfectly and fully revealed in Christ. When do you see Jesus ever turning away from a sinner and saying, I am too holy to look upon your sin? Did Jesus ever do anything like that? No. It was, in fact, the Pharisees that did that. The Pharisees were the ones that would say, I am too holy to look upon you and turn away. I want to suggest to you that God is like Jesus, not like a Pharisee. He's not turning away from us. As we turn away from God, the gospel is that no matter where we turn, God is always there confronting us with His love. This is not, the gospel is not this. That is not the gospel. This is the gospel. That when we turn away from God, He turns towards us. And when we turn away from God, He turns toward us. And when we run away from God, He confronts us with His love. And even when we murder God, He confronts us with forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's a healthier, more biblical understanding of the gospel that doesn't pit God against Christ, but understands this, that God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There's never been a time when God was not like Jesus. We haven't always known this, but now we do. Jesus, God's one and only Son. He came to earth to save us, each and every one. Jesus, our King, the very best indeed. One time He rode into the town, sitting on a donkey. Into Jerusalem, for all to see. People cheered and celebrated, waving palm tree leaves. Shouting Hosanna, for the King had come that day It's Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee He did amazing things, too many to count Let's all sing it, dance and shout He did amazing things, too many to count Let's all sing it, shout That Jesus was crucified He gave himself up on a cross And then he died But three days later He rose from that grave His tomb is empty And our sins he forgave He's risen He is alive Our Savior, our friend Our King Jesus is A-OK -okay. And now we celebrate Jesus, our risen King, who came to save us. And for this we sing, He did amazing things, too many to count. Let's all sing it, dance and shout. He did amazing things, too many to count. Let's all 
Let's pray together. Why don't you bow your heads and we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together, shall we? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Thank you.